Hi, um, my name is Mira. Um, I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up. I wanted to be a doctor like my dad, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to be a doctor. I thought it would be so cool to save people's lives. So I applied to college as a biology major, and I got accepted. And a few months just before going to college, my dad thought it would be a good idea to get me two female doctors that didn't know each other to just tell me about their experience and tell me about their lives and, you know, being a doctor, what that was all about. And they both sat me down and they told me stories about sacrifice, about how much they had to give up to do what they're doing, how they had not traveled anywhere, they hadn't really had a decent relationship. They were 35. They um, felt that they had missed out on a lot of life. But most importantly, they told me about not being able to be a superhero. That sometimes you do your best and you try to do everything you can, and sometimes people die, and there's nothing you could do about it. And you always feel when that happens that you failed. So other than making me cry my eyeballs out, it kind of made me just decide that maybe that wasn't so much what I wanted to do. <laughs> so a few months before going to college, I'm already accepted. Like, the train has left the station. I'm like, OK, what am I going to do for a living? So I decided that I've always wanted to work with my hands, and I like working with my hands. That's why I actually wanted to be a surgeon, not even a doctor. I used to be a 12-year-old that used to say, I want to be a surgeon. <laughs> They all just look at me like, okay. <laughs> so I, you know, just crazy kind of turn of uh, events, and I find my way into the ar architecture department at the American University of Beirut, getting accepted there through talking to some people and begging them to let me in and try that. And then I did a little bit of architecture, and then I decided, mm, this takes too long. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, for those of you who know me, I kind of like doing things with like <laughs> my attention span, you know, <laughs> like I like getting things done a little quicker. So that kind of um, the architecture program I was in was in a design department, architect an architecture design and engineering department. It was actually the first of its kind in the Middle East where design was part of an engineering and architecture department that was looked at as like really a problem solving. Um, program. Um, so I ended up just easily switching into design. I did a design program. I ended up, like for me, the American University there was, um, it's led by an American president, it's Board of Trustees is, you know, um, in New York. It's very, it became almost like a little haven for me in Beirut where all these different people attended it and came from all sorts of walks of life different backgrounds, different religions, different point of views, grew up in different ways, all coming here into one place. And we supported each other, and we collaborated, and we did things that we never thought we could do. And it was just, it really made me grow as a human, just that whole experience, other than just getting a design degree. But that almost, like, it made me feel like the world is so big, and I just could do so much. So that, I finished that thinking, I need more. I'm just not done. So I knew that I loved film, and I knew that I loved music, and I loved sound, and I loved conceptual art. So somehow, through a conversation with the chairman of the department at the time, she told me about this program called VCU Ad Center that had just opened up. It had been around for maybe for a year or two. And she said, um, maybe you should consider that. So I looked into it. I applied, got in, but then that made me go, oh my god, the program starts in a month. Here I was, like, 
all my friends, my family, Beirut, where I'd grown up, like all these things, I was suddenly leaving it, not just to go to college or to go to like this other experience, I was leaving to go to Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> I think anybody from anywhere in the States moving to Richmond, Virginia might have a hard time. I was moving from Beirut to Richmond, Virginia, and I didn't know anybody. So, as you can imagine, I get to Richmond and I'm just like, hello. <laughs> I get there, it was a great experience. I got, um, during my time there, I happened to work on a conceptual art project that for me really was um, a project that I really, like I was experiencing so much and I was really starting to notice so many things. Um, that I did a conceptual art project about what I thought about my whole experience of being in the States, about how we consumed here, about how media controlled what we thought was our point of view, um, how it affected us and how strongly it affected us. So I did a conceptual art project about that. And then somehow, through one or two people, I think in this room, it ended up on Dan Wyden's desk. And that got me my job at Wyden and Kennedy. Um, it was not a traditional portfolio, it was a project that I was super passionate about, that I did and I was super proud of, and it just kind of karma or things aligning, it just made its way, and I got this job at Wyden and Kennedy. And for me, getting a job at Wyden and Kennedy in my early 20s was the best job, like, it was kind of like this really far-fetched dream that I didn't even think was possible. Not only was I from Beirut, I was a woman in advertising, a creative woman in advertising, and Wyden and Kennedy at the time was maybe 120 people. So the odds of those things combined made it almost next to impossible for me to get that job. So I got lucky, I got to Wyden, I uh, got to work on all these different things. The first year there, I got to work on 1,001 pitches, which was really fun. <laughs> um, but then I got to work on Nike, I got to work on Nike Woman, and I had grown up such an athlete, I'd been on the track team, and I'd grown up a dancer, and I'd done so many things that for me, like Nike Widen combined was just like, it was like, oh my God, you know, like how could I get so lucky to be working on a brand that I respected so much, and you know, something that I believed in so much, and through the work we did that, you know, got celebrated and won awards and cons and all these awards and things, I really learned how you can connect to people. I learned how you can inspire them, how advertising was not all shit and it just didn't all suck and that, you know, some of it could really inspire people and connect with them and move them and, you know, affect things positively. And that really changed just everything. It just like made me realize how we could tell stories. And we, you know, we could like be something, a brand could be aspirational. So that really just changed the way I thought about things and the kind of work I wanted to do and um, just what I would work on and what I wouldn't work on. And you know, I started having opinions about all these things. So um, I was there for 10 years. I have no idea how 10 years went by, but they did. Um, I, start, I got to a point where I felt I had other ideas about things I wanted to put out in the world, things I wanted to share. And working a full-time job was just not allowing me that. It like didn't make space or time, even just mental space, to even think about these or develop them further. So I decided that it was time for me to jump into the deep end, not know where my next paycheck was gonna come from, and just try some new things and see where they lead. Um, and I thought, what's the worst that can happen? I can always get another full-time job. Like, you know, it, it's fine, and let me just take some risks, because I was kind of at that point where I was like old enough and young enough, and I felt I really still didn't have that much to lose. So I might as well just jump now, while I still had the guts to. So. I jumped and I've been working on projects that I'm super passionate about and the reason I'm here today is to share one of those projects called The Wonder Clock. Hi, my name is Mira and I'm ticking. I'm also loving, creating, traveling, thinking, laughing, nurturing, 
evolving, and making money. But the ticking is getting louder. Why do I feel that somehow, at my core, I'm failing? Lurching towards that time, unless I turn to the wonders of science, when I'll be unable to bear my own children. I created this clock to face my own fears, to beckon the elephant in the room, so to speak, to release my own power, my own choices, to open a dialogue with other women about fertility, empowerment, and loving ourselves. We are women, and we are ticking, but we are so much more. I had just turned 30, and I was on top of the world. I was in a great place in my career. I had just won a bunch of lines. I had been doing work that I was super proud of, and I thought I could do no wrong. And I went in for a doctor's appointment. And my doctor said, do you want to have kids one day? And I thought, yeah, I, I do, yeah. And he looked at me and he said, so what are you waiting for? And I just thought, I, I was just traveling and working. Ran away. <laughs> Perfect cue there. <laughs> um, I just felt as if somebody had punched me in the stomach. I was like, wait a second, I was just 25. I was just traveling and working and learning and growing and figuring out. He came back. <laughs> figuring out who I was in this world. And now you're talking to me about having children? I'm 30. So I just thought, oh my god, I can't be the only one out there that just started feeling like I needed to think about this thing that, you know, was ticking. I grew up in a home where I was raised to be completely equal to my brothers. We were taught that we could both do anything we wanted. We were equal. There was nothing that my brothers could do that I couldn't do. And I thought, that that was the truth. I just thought, I just kind of believed it and never ever doubted it for one second. But this was the first time in my life where I was like, wait a second, I'm not equal to my brothers. I'm, there's, a phys, there's a biological thing that makes me very different than my brothers. And there's a decision that I have to take at some point that makes me very different than these two other humans that I love so much. So I just started thinking about it, and I started just doing some research and going online, and then it started beco becoming like this thing where I was like, this is so crazy. So we grow up and we're told all our lives how not to get pregnant. <laughs> and then you want to start getting information about how to get pregnant or what the whole thing involves or what age is the, you know, kind of the limit, all this stuff. And there's nothing out there about this, like little sprinkles here and there. And I was like, this is crazy. How do we as women make better choices without enough information about this? So I just started talking to anybody who would talk to me. I started talking to any doctor who would talk to me, calling up people I'd gone to college who went on to actually become the doctors I wanted to become. And uh, I just would talk to anybody. I'd email IVF play, you know, uh, specialists. I'd, anybody who would talk to me, I just wanted more information about this. I wanted to know more. And I started just gathering all this information. I started figuring out from graphs and charts and interviews and things that I did just, you know, what was that real limit? We had heard of 35, but was that even real? You know, I wanted to know more about this. What was the age? You know, is there a reality? We, um, we live in societies where a lot of times as women, we're very much like, just we see celebrities and they get pregnant at 48 and, you know, you think that's real and <laughs> nobody tells you that, you know, she had to use a donor, a 20-year-old donor egg and, these realities that we're just never told and nobody talks about them because, you know, celebrities are perfect and they just had babies at 48 years old. So I just thought, okay, we need, I need to do a 
project about this, and I need to put out there something about the biological clock. So I just started thinking about what that idea would be. And then I thought, the only way women are very different than men in that they have their kind of inner group of friends and you know, girlfriends that they talk to about intimate stuff, but they don't talk to, to other people outside of that about things like age and fertility issues that they're going through. And it's not a public discussion that happens, you know? So I thought, okay, what's the most interesting and provocative way I could actually do this? And I thought, by making myself the most vulnerable possible. Women do not talk about their age, you know? It's like, you ask a woman her age and she, she just tries to avoid the subject. And I thought, not only am I gonna talk about my age, but I'm gonna talk about my biological clock that's gonna end one day and it's just gonna expire. And if I put that out there in the world, in the most public way possible, and I thought, okay, what's the most public way possible? The internet. I could just put it online for everybody to watch. <laughs> so I decided that I was gonna do a website and I called it The Wonder Clock. And the reason behind The Wonder Clock is because just women and their anatomy and their reproductive system is a one, I'm just, it's such a mystery to me. And I just think that that was kind of a really interesting name to call this thing. And I put out my Wonder Clock online and it counts down to this age that I got from all these different doctors um, that they agreed to that was like the limit where women can have kids naturally without any help. And without any help, I don't mean like just, you know, getting IVF because a lot of doctors even agreed that after 43, 44, you can't get IVF unless you use donor eggs. So they don't even accept, they think it's a waste, you know, of money to even try after that limit. So anyway, I thought, I'm gonna put this out there and I'm going to just make a statement about this. But then I thought that was, it's okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna put it out there, but I, I just don't think it's enough. I don't think it's enough. It's a statement, it's a like provocative statement, but it's not enough. I need to invite more women into this. And that's when I thought, I'm gonna develop an app. I'm gonna develop an app where women can actually download their own biological clocks on their, clo on their phones, and they could look at it, and it could make this really abstract, intangible thing, very tangible, right there in their hand, and they could look at it, and it becomes this point of reference. Even if the age fluctuates a bit, it's, I'm using this like age just to kind of make a statement and start a conversation, and it becomes this real thing that they can look at and they can like have a conversation around and they could make choices, you know? And especially my hope was that Wonder Clock becomes this place where whether I'm posting it or other people are posting it through Facebook, through Twitter, everything is aggregated on the site and kind of brought into one place and people can start getting more information about this topic and they could start, you know, we could just start a community of women contributing to this topic and kind of just learning more and um, by getting more knowledge because only with more knowledge are we going to make better decisions, you know? You could decide to have a child, you could not decide to have a child, but that should be your choice and that should be something that you have enough information to make a choice about. So I made the app and then I thought, okay, so I do not work at a big agency anymore. I really need to put this out in the world and I really need to have it get a lot of attention. I need to like not just tell a few friends, but I'd like to get more people to know about this. How do I do that? If advertising has taught me well, how do I do that in the most guerrilla, provocative way with very little money compared to multi-million dollar budgets that I had working on big brands? So I came up with the idea that I was going to go and launch this project at Art Basel last year in June of 2012. And if the Apple gods coordinated and my app got approved, I was going to make it and launch this thing there. So I decided that I'm not just gonna go and say project this somewhere on a wall at Art Basel. I'm going to design a piece that lives on me and is actually a ticking clock and that I wear 
I'm not going to the airport with this. <laughs> that I actually wear, and it is my clock. And I am the living, breathing, ticking clock, and why not wear it on me? This is who? <laughs> this is what my project's all about. It's about me ticking and going towards that time. So I went to Art Basel, and just, you know, being who I am, I reached out to, like, anybody that I knew in the art world, and friends, and, you know, people that I knew, and then I started just being invited to all these different events. So I ended up at a Jeff Koons party that was five hours long, that Jeff Koons only showed up for half an hour, but then there was the Wonder Clock. So people just came up to me. First they thought it was like some kind of fashion accessory and you know, where I, they asked where I got it from and if they could get one. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, especially the women, they kind of have one. So um, I started having conversations with people about it and the Huffington Post talked to me about it and took some pictures and then the Atlantic Wire and then the New York Times and then all these people just started coming up to me and thinking it was this cool fashion accessory and then discovering it was my bio biological clock and going, oh. <laughs> so I went there. It was this incredible experience of just one thing led to the other, led to another conversation, led to another meeting, another person, people introducing me to people. Like it just kind of took on almost like a life of its own. And I started realizing that I had just put my energy in all the right places and just kind of followed this thing that I was passionate about and I wanted to put out in the world. And then things just came. Things just came and it grew and it grew and it grew. So I started getting emails from women sharing the most personal stories about fertility and miscarriages and struggles and all these things that I just, you know, I first started, I thought that this would like hit a nerve with a lot of people. I didn't think that random strangers were going to be telling me how much they've struggled to have kids even at 32 years old. Like, I didn't think that it would be that intense and provocative of a project. I knew it would like do something. I didn't know it was going to do that much. So I just started getting these emails that would just blow my mind and people just telling me how I made them laugh and I made them cry and you know it was this thing that they were dealing with and they couldn't talk to anybody about it and that somebody out there was doing something that like made it not like taboo and not shameful and not weird to talk about this thing so all of this to say that it was just it's amazing what happens when you follow something that you're passionate about and it's amazing where it leads you and money, no money, just go out and do anything that you're passionate about and follow it because it's rewarding in way more ways than you ever thought possible. Thank you.